100 años, un jovencito de muy bajos recursos llamado Joseph Nathanael Goodard de St. John en Barbados se dirigió a la ciudad de Bridgeton para vender su vaca. Lo que Joseph no sabía era que ese viaje sería el comienzo para emprender una gran empresa que llevaría su descendencia a diferentes lugares del mundo, los cuales durante su época Joseph solo podía visitar a través de las páginas de un libro. De esta manera surgió una empresa muy diversa con bases sólidas en cuanto a valores, como son la lealtad, honradez y la perseverancia. Por supuesto, esas virtudes empezaron con el fundador y su esposa, Wilamina, quien exigía una estricta disciplina a sus hijos y nietos. Y esos fueron los principios sobre los cuales el fundador construyó la empresa junto a su hijo Víctor. En esos días la vida no era tan estructurada como es hoy en términos de dar información sobre cómo mejor hacer algo. Tenías que más o menos aprender la manera hard way. Tenías que observar, kind of observe, see, do, and y cosas que no funcionaron, no funcionaron de nuevo, tipo de cosa. My father used to take me to the cheap side, where the cheap side market now is. We had a rum barn there, and we used to um, blend and bottle rum, both for domestic consumption and for export. In those days, we had two brands of rum: Gold Braid, which is what we mainly exported and sold to the top end of the market here in Barbados, and a brand called Top Notch. And when I went to the rum bottling barn as a small boy, I was probably only 13, 14, talking about, um, I would use the bottling machine. They had an old time bottling machine and you operated like if you were milking a cow. <laughs> It only handled a dozen bottles at a time and you had to put the bottles up into these nipples They would be filling all the time, and as they filled, you would remove them and pass them to someone who would then cap them and start to label them. All this was hand done. We didn't have a, a production line at that time. Being one of the younger ones, I came in and uh, when there were already three or four of my cousins in the business, John had come back, John Stanley had come back from Canada, Colin had come back from Canada. Richard was in the supermarket business. David Patterson, my, another cousin, he was in the food wholesale. Randall was in, I come back from Canada and they were mostly all Canadian trained. Richard and David Patterson also were Canadian trained in their fields. So um, I was the kind of exceptional, um, the different one because I was an English trained person and I, had, I was a lot younger than them. And then Philip also came back around just after I arrived. I think Philip turned up within a year. The first job was to fill in part of the Graham Hall swamp in Rendezvous. I had, they had bought at some time 10 acres of swamp land in there and a block of apartments exactly where um, or it's known as, I call it the Ernst Young Building, but it's right there at the corner of Rendezvous. That was a fairly big construction, earth-moving job, and I used, uh, I contracted out a lot, all the work. Nothing prepared me for that, really. I mean, I, my I, university life was in mathematics, and here I was being given 10 acres to recover, recoup from a swamp and bring it into dry land. When I first came back, Uncle Victor put me into the supermarket on Broad Street where the Bank of Nova Scotia now is. He told me he wanted me to learn customs because the gentleman that used to do the customs would be retiring shortly, and he wanted me to take over the customs. But other than that, I was to learn the layout of the store, or how everything, the modus operandi of the store. I used to keep the, the books in the little office at Goddard's on Broad Street and the, all the meetings were held at Kensington. And when Uncle Vic wanted to hold a meeting, he would get hold of me one way or another, tell me, call in, bring the minute book, uh, meet me at Kensington, that's all I heard. And I would go to Kensington, I would take the minutes, make some notes and so forth, because I couldn't write shorthand, but I would take them home, and my wife, who was a qualified stenographer, she would, 
take the minutes, and I would take them back down with me next morning and stick them in the minute book. And I would take them and show them to Uncle Vic and let him read them and initial each page if he was satisfied with it so that when the next meeting came around there wouldn't be any fuss and bother about something any minutes, you know. Desde el modesto inicio en un pequeño abasto en la calle Prince William Henry, en 1921, hasta la mudanza a un espacio más grande y prestigioso ubicado en la calle Broad, la empresa se ha transformado en un conglomerado internacional que opera en 26 países. Esta organización se ha basado en asociaciones y acuerdos duraderos que han soportado desastres naturales, crisis económicas, etc. Durante los últimos 100 años, la empresa ha sido testigo de un extraordinario crecimiento debido, en gran medida, a sus asociaciones permanentes. Inicialmente, se estableció una alianza con la corporación de Flight Kitchen y recientemente con Sky Chefs, quien opera con la empresa en 21 países, en Centro y Sudamérica. Adicionalmente, la empresa Antiseptic Limited Trading, hoy en día llamada Terrific Tiles, de Barbados, quien forma parte de la división de suministro de construcción y es otra empresa familiar perteneciente a la segunda generación, se ha visto fortalecida cada vez más desde que unió fuerzas con la compañía Goodard Enterprise Limited en 1977. La organización llamada Caribbean Level Craft es la principal impresora de etiquetas de buena calidad en el Caribe y se encarga de exportar etiquetas para algunos productos bien conocidos de la región. Esta entidad se remonta a unos 35 años atrás en conjunto con Goodard Enterprise Limited. Uno de los más recientes acuerdos ha sido entre Agustinians Limited y la empresa de Goodard con la formación de Caribbean Distribution Partners, una empresa conjunta de distribución que opera en Trinidad y Barbados. Esta empresa está dirigida por un exgerente de GLM y ha ido creciendo continuamente desde su fundación siendo actualmente una de las compañías de distribución líder en el sur del Caribe. Our training had taken us and made us different to what the prior generation required of a job and it was through our our change that eventually we could manage a diverse business. As a group we took a decision that we would move into the region more in the food area and we began to acquire some additional businesses over the years. Um, a lot of the main principles that we had preferred to have a, a company representing them in the region that had its own kind of distribution outlets in each island. We went through a period of rapid acquisitions. We started a little, a, a little flight kitchen at the airport, Seawell Airport. And the business was so good for those few years that within three years we had to we had to treble the size of the flight kitchen. Al ir creciendo la compañía, sus hijos y yernos seguían trabajando en el negocio. Sus hijos regresaron de estudiar en el extranjero a finales de los años 50 y 60 y la cara de la empresa empezó a cambiar a medida que se organizaban y entraban en función nuevas actividades. De esta manera, se dio la necesidad de reestructurar y reorganizar la corporación, acogiendo así talentos de otros miembros de la familia, además de otros profesionales calificados y así poder expandir la firma a otras áreas. En 1972, una reorganización rigurosa se llevó a cabo en la Junta. Cuando los nietos ascendieron en la empresa, estos directores no solo operaban en la comisión de Goodard Enterprise, sino que muchos de ellos se desempeñaban en la junta de varias corporaciones estatutarias, compañías regionales y organizaciones como la Cámara de Comercio. Los Goodard eran muy prestigiosos en los círculos corporativos de Barbados y de la región. En 1993, John Stanley fue nombrado caballero por el gobierno de Barbados, por su contribución al comercio y a la comunidad, jugó un papel decisivo en el asentamiento comercial y fue el primer presidente del organismo del sector privado de Barbados. También fue uno de los arquitectos conjuntos en la formación de la Asociación Social Tripartita, que se ha convertido en un excelente ejemplo del sector público 
privado y laboral en todo el mundo. Fue durante ese tiempo cuando la empresa decidió contratar y nombrar gerentes con los más altos niveles, personal profesional independiente que pudiese llevar la compañía hacia adelante, basándose efectivamente en los valores de entrega, dedicación y prestación de servicio por los cuales la organización se había hecho conocida. And it was better to get the right person, likely not to be family, to run the business and make a success or keep making a further success of it, rather than, than have family in the job for the sake of having family in the job and not having a good job done. Up until then, the executive management team was almost exclusively Barbadians who had grown up within the company and largely who had never worked internationally. So we hired um, international agents to, to do the search and we decided that the, one of the criteria would be that we choose someone with international experience. We decided to look first regionally within the Caribbean as a first choice but we were determined that if we did not find the right candidate, we would extend the search globally. Um, we happened to find a Caribbean national um, with international experience in, in, in Tony Alley, and then so we were satisfied and did not look further. We always want best in class. We don't think about gender, we don't think about race, we don't think about geography. As we expand and we grow, we need executives who bring a truly international flair because that's where we're growing more and more. But we also bring, need executives who understand the spirit and the culture of the organization and who fit, and that's probably the most important thing, who fit the strategy of where we're going. They bring the right management style. And so, you know, we, every company has its own culture and style and we have one as well and I think it's extremely important that we continue to feed and develop that culture. The Goddard Enterprises Limited as a new trending global corporate um, entity always seeks to ensure that we recruit the best talent and ensure that we have the right fit as part of our cultural transformation. To ensure that we recruit right persons we tend to also focus on key leadership competencies and behaviors. And so as we recruit and bring persons in, we typically would do an evaluation to ensure that they meet to those competencies that lend to being the best leader going forward. La organización también ha evolucionado de una empresa familiar a una multicultural, de género mixto y de grupos racialmente diversos, incorporando así gerente de todos los países en los cuales opera la empresa. I'm the chief financial officer responsible for the entire group. So not just in Barbados, but the entire group, all the divisions. Um, I would have started in the group at a very young age, at the age of 23 years old. Um, I was recruited to be the financial controller of one of the subsidiaries, Hypat Limited, where I spent five and a half years there before I was promoted to group financial officer for one year. Then I acted in the position of chief financial officer for another year and then eventually I was um, given the position effective January 1st, 2008. Goddard's by its very nature of its businesses and the locations is a very diverse group and that diversity then obviously allows you then obviously you recruit people in the various cultures. We have female managers at the top in some of these places, we have females in human resources, finance, um, even on the board. So Goddard's in itself, when you say Goddard's, you know, it, diversity is the name. La primera reunión de administradores en 1973 trajo a todos los gerentes de las distintas compañías subsidiarias del Goodard Enterprise Limited en el Caribe a un mismo espacio para darle lugar a un plan de debate acerca del futuro. En 1978, teníamos nada menos que 78 participantes que llegaron de cuatro islas a la reunión anual. 
interactuaron, compartieron ideas y prepararon planes de ejecución para la empresa. La junta también fue útil para examinar las actividades del mercado en todos los segmentos de la compañía, establecer estrategias de personal, temas laborales y diversas normas políticas que fueron compartidas en el grupo. Ese mismo año, hubo una importante reestructuración de las divisiones de la empresa. Para septiembre de 1978, la reunión de directores adoptó un nuevo nombre para la organización y con él un nuevo sello. Anteriormente era llamado J.N. Goodard and Sons Ltd. y su nuevo nombre llegaba a ser Goodard Enterprise Limited. En diciembre de 1979 se ofrecieron 320 mil acciones al personal por tan solo un dólar cada acción. La oferta fue sobresuscrita, por lo que la organización dejó de ser una empresa familiar para convertirse en una corporación que cotizaba en la bolsa con más de mil empleados como accionistas. Así que muchas personas pudieron generar riquezas a través de la propiedad de acciones de Gouda Enterprise Limited, ya que una acción de solo un dólar era el equivalente a 16 acciones y el valor actual de las acciones sería de 36.60 dólares. En mayo de 1980, fueron ofrecidas al público 2.5 millones de acciones a 2 dólares cada una, aumentando así la base del accionista e inyectando capital para el negocio, dejando espacio para una mayor expansión. Por lo que en 1987, cuando se inauguró el intercambio de seguridad de Barbados, Goodard Enterprise Limited fue una de las primeras empresas locales de la propiedad pública que cotizó en la bolsa. Además, hubo otro gran desarrollo en 1980. Goodard Enterprise le dio la bienvenida a sus dos directores no ejecutivos a la Junta, el abogado J.C. Armstrong y la directora de Queen College de Melissa Painter. A través de los años, la conformación de la Junta ha ido cambiando. When I joined the board in 2012, at that time the board was made up roughly 50% by executive, the executive management of the company and 50% by non-executives. And it was chaired by the former CEO of the company, Mr. Joe Goddard. And it was a natural evolution for a family company where the management, where the board, where the shareholders. Um, and at that stage, it was sparked by the fact that Mr. Joe was going to retire in a year. And at the same time, we decided that the board should transition to being an entirely non-executive board and that the only executive that would stay on the board would be the CEO and the CEO would be the bridge between the board and the management. This, this meant that we also had to have a change in the functioning of the board because where the board used to very much focus on management type decisions We were now taking those decisions and saying these belong to the management team. So the, what we've evolved into is a company where it, it is very, very clear that the driving force of running the company is the management. They are the professionals. They have been hired with the right expertise to run the company. And they recommend policy, strategy, and a budget to the board. Mm -hmm. And the board's input is pretty well restricted to approving policy and strategy and budgets and to the appointment of the CEO and to holding the CEO accountable for management carrying out the plans that they have brought to the board. No todo estaba claro en la travesía por el largo camino. Hubo algunas áreas en las cuales la compañía se involucró y que no siempre fueron las adecuadas. Los directores reconocieron a tiempo que una mente comercial madura tiene que reconocer sus competencias básicas y salir de aquellas que no lo son. En los 100 años de historia de la organización, hubo elementos que solo operaron por un tiempo, por ejemplo, la industria hotelera. En el año 1940, la tendencia mundial estaba dirigida hacia el turismo. La compañía había adquirido entonces el prestigioso Hotel Marine, seguido por Windsor y el Crane en St. Philip en 1950. 
Sin embargo, para 1972, sin un cuadro de directores hoteleros totalmente calificados en la isla, la empresa decide vender el Hotel Marín. Es irónico que su último cometido fue la celebración de los 50 aniversarios de Gooder. En 1960, luego del crecimiento del negocio de tiendas de comestibles, se dio el aparente éxito de uno de los primeros supermercados de autoservicio en la Feria de Alimentos Kensington. La corporación abrió otro abasto en la costa sur, es decir, el mercado Rendezvous y Simpson en Worthing. Pero finalmente, la recesión, junto con el panorama cambiante debido a las nuevas y grandes plantas de supermercados, obligaron a tomar la decisión de salir del negocio de los abastos. La adquisición del Hotel Crane condujo inesperadamente al comienzo de la cocina de vuelos en Barbados. TransCanada Airways fue el primer cliente. El precursor de Air Canada se acercó al negocio y debido a la proximidad del aeropuerto, preguntaron si podrían proporcionar algunas comidas a bordo. Ellos requirieron solo 40 comidas frías una vez por semana para el vuelo. La primera entrega estuvo a tiempo y la comida fue de buena calidad. Esa era la clave. Fue el génesis de la cocina para vuelos embarbados. Ahora es una división multinacional con 34 compañías operativas en 21 países, tan al sur como Uruguay y tan al norte como Miami, Florida. Las primeras 40 comidas que entregamos nos abrieron las puertas para comprometernos con otras aerolíneas que tuvieron similares solicitudes como KLM, Panamericana y después Boag, actualmente British Airways. Todos tienen contratos con la cocina de vuelos de Barbados. Uno de los mayores logros de la empresa durante años fue el abastecimiento del primer vuelo del Concord a la isla. Ese fue el real jubileo de plata. Pero había una visión mucho más grande para la cocina de vuelo de Barbados. En 1975, llamé al equipo de management para discutir strategy for the future of the growth of the Barbados Flight Kitchen throughout the region. We had strengthened the uh, financial situation of the Flight Kitchen tremendously with Marriott's input, with the changes that they made in the operational and uh, fiscal audits that they provided uh, on a routine basis. At that meeting, I put a map up on the, uh, on the side of the wall, and I said, we have to look at every place that it's possible to have a flight kitchen. And we can have the red locations are almost instantly operational, and we put those buttons in. And then I put some yellow ones up for the next ones that would be possible in the near future. And then I would look at the ones with white buttons, which were at the outside. And we went from the Bahamas to Bermuda, all the way down to Central America and Northern South America. And we discussed the possibility of where we would go and how we would do it. And I said, you know, you have to prepare yourselves to move out of Barbados to make this thing really grow. Well, it's the only way to grow. GL, specifically JCG, did a great job in terms of expanding uh, the business in Latin America. Uh, now the company has presence from Uruguay to Central America, lots of places in uh, South America, and of course, a very strong presence on the Caribbean. Uh, and the challenge uh, for that is how to move from being a regional company to become an international company, and then after that to become a really global player uh, into that. When I came to here, Uh, I got exactly the uh, challenge for uh, bringing some international expertise and bringing, let's say, expertise from a global company uh, 
uh, to support GCG in terms of the process uh, on uh, the expansion that we have. Today, it's important to say that from the footprint perspective, GCG is the largest catering airline catering company uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is not on the revenue perspective, but from the presence that we have in the countries. Uh, and what we want to do is we want now to leverage this presence that we have in more than 20 countries to expand our business lines and reduce the dependence on just the airline catering, but expanding in different areas like industrial catering, hospital catering, ground handling, and other services uh, that we want to get. Because doing that, we will be able to become more and more international and looking into the future uh, with a less dependence of the airline industry. Hoy la empresa llamada Goodard Enterprise Limited celebra su 100 aniversario y es posible observar cómo ha resistido las diversas crisis durante todo este periodo. Las cualidades como la fuerza, la resiliencia, la previsión y la visión pionera de los fundadores han servido bien a la organización permitiendo seguir adelante desde los días iniciales hasta el día de hoy. Podemos destacar también que la empresa tuvo la primera sala refrigerada en Barbados, diseñada y construida para almacenar carne importada de Argentina. Adicionalmente, en el pasado, la empresa contaba solo con bicicletas y vehículos tirados por caballos para realizar sus entregas. Posteriormente, la empresa obtuvo sus primeras furgonetas motorizadas para llevar a cabo los suministros, lo que les permitió aumentar el servicio de entrega a toda la isla. Actualmente, la empresa sigue enfrentando desastres modernos. Por ejemplo, en 2020, la pandemia de COVID-19 cerró la mayoría de los países del mundo. Los viajes aéreos y los cruceros se detuvieron por esa razón. El mundo se detuvo. Adicionalmente, durante este tiempo, el pueblo del Caribe tuvo que enfrentar los desafíos de la erupción del volcán La Soufrière en San Vicente. A pesar de eso, una vez más, el espíritu innovador que plantaron los fundadores de esta empresa sigue floreciendo. It's forced us to reevaluate what we do, how we do it. It's forced us to reorganize and restructure internally within the businesses themselves. And so we're sitting on assets, we're sitting on capabilities that are unique in a lot of the Caribbean. And what we found is that we had to basically start to develop a way to diversify what we do. And so you, as an example, take a look at our flight kitchens. You know, what we do is we buy food, we transform food, and we serve food. You look at most of our manufacturing businesses, they do the same thing. We manufacture and we sell. Now, with the pandemic, people can't get out. People are afraid to get out. Um, you know, people, there are all sorts of security issues around the pandemic um, with lockdowns in place. And then you have the actual the vulnerable who are just fearful of going out and being exposed. So, one of the things we decided to do is how can we transform our businesses into a digital type of media where we can transact with our customers um, electronically. You look at Courtesy Garage, we now have an electronic showroom. You can actually virtually go in and tour our showroom, look at cars, and even get in and do a test drive virtually. The future of the automotive division is that um, we are definitely going to be growing in terms of expanding the auto. Um, we are that aligned with government's policy to support um, electrification of the industry. We sell um, Nissan and Hyundai, which are currently one of the two leading brands in electrification. Uh, we have the beautiful LEAF models, which have been out and proven and tested over the last eight years. And also the um, new, newly arrived Kona EV and hybrid models. So the automotive division is perfectly aligned with what the future has to hold. You look at our kitchens, and again, what we've done is we've created a website, what I call a mall, uh, an electronic mall, and most of our companies that sell food are now listed on that website. It's called orderupgo.com, and on it you can find Wings on Wheels, you can find GCG Events, you can find Purity, you can find McBride, you can find Hanshel Innes. So you can now shop for your groceries, buy food, if you're working at home and you're going to be late and you know you're not going to be able to get to the grocery in time because it's closing early because of the COVID, 
you can now order food and have it delivered at a specified time. And our intent is to push that envelope into how do we transform from brick and mortar to a click and mortar type of business. We're launching a new website in building supplies, which will basically allow the exact same thing. We will continue to focus on organic growth within the markets that we exist um, presently. We are market leaders and our leadership in these positions have, have largely been driven by a strong sense of integrity, a strong sense of fairness, and espousing the values that Goddard Enterprises as a whole cherishes daily. Goddard, however, has lifted for us the quality and expectation of business in, in our markets. Goddard does not beat a big drop. It lets the companies that it has acquired do its talking for it. Um, and we believe strongly that we are highly respected because of all the values and all the commitment, the discipline and the commitment to fairness that we have demonstrated time and time again over the last 50 years. We have some very ambitious and, and aggressive plans to build out the division. We plan on making significant uh, investments in our current plant and equipment, um, reduce costs, improve efficiencies, consistency of quality, uh, increase uh, our capacity, um, not only so that we can continue to grow current market share, but so that we can enter into new markets, uh, new export markets. We are already in over 50 export markets around the world. We ship our products as far as China and Japan. And, um, but there's more opportunity, obviously, a lot more opportunity in 50 countries. So um, we believe that by making that investment, we will be able to um, be more competitive in some of the export markets and enter new markets. And necessarily when you grow, you have to hire more people. It's about changing the type of job, really. In the coming weeks and months ahead, I will endeavor to transform the shipping division into a global supply chain solutions network with the express freight services location in Miami being the hub of that network. It will be our mission to provide um, excellent global supply chain services, not only to the Goddard group of companies, but also to leverage that those resources, that infrastructure, to provide global supply chain solutions to third parties as well. I see us expanding um, over the next 10 to 20 years into other geographic regions. Así que desde ese primer cliente que compró un galón de ron y un poco de pescado salado en aquella pequeña tienda de comestibles en Bridgeton el 13 de octubre de 1921 a más de 60 empresas que operan en 26 países. La empresa llamada Gooder Enterprise Limited ha crecido gracias a la perseverancia de sus fundadores, la lealtad de su personal y la visión de sus equipos de gestión. En diversos aspectos, la empresa ha soportado sus primeros 100 años y espera con anticipación poder superar los desafíos y oportunidades para el próximo siglo.